<laughs> and uh, the oil production came with a lot of expectations. Local content, revenue, uh, management bill, job creation along the coastal areas, give us 10% of the oil revenue, say the Western Chiefs. So two years after full production of oil, what are the real facts? Has the oil been transformational? Some would say Ghana's economic growth in 2011 was the highest anywhere in the world because of oil. We grew around 14%. No country grew higher than Ghana in 2011. And it was purely because of the role of oil. But what about the translation of growth into jobs? What about the management of revenue? What about the payment of corporate taxes? What about the the, the issue of externalities and the effects of the oil production on local communities and job creation. What's the verdict on all of these things? Well, we have two experts in the studio to help us appreciate the matters. Joe Asamoah is an oil and gas energy, environment, and climate change consultant. Dr. Asamoah received his PhD from the University of Wits in the South African city of Joburg. An MBA from uh, Harriet Watt in Edinburgh, BSc, KNUST. In 1998, he received an international award for, of Professor Thomas Kuhn, under the auspices of the International Academy of Science and International Union of Air Pollution and Environmental Protection. He is an oil and gas guy. He's written a number of books, two of which I've gone through, Making the Oil and Gas Find in Ghana a Blessing. Uh, and there's another which is generally on the oil and gas sector in the world. I have a copy of the book here in front of me. Now, my other guest is uh, Mohamed Amin Adab, who is the Executive Director of the Africa Center for Energy Policy. Gentlemen, you are welcome to the show. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We've been producing oil for two and is it two years? Since, um, yeah, let's see, two, years. two years. Because end of 2010, and uh, we are in 2013 now. Um, what would you say is the most remarkable thing about the oil we've been producing? Are we... Uh, have we have has the oil production met your expectations? Well, in a way, I would say not. So far, as the volumes are concerned, because uh, initially the projection was that we're going to produce um, later on at the peak of one twenty thousand barrels a day. We did not reach that. At some stage, the production went down to about sixty-three thousand because of some technical hitches. The good thing is that due to acidize, acidize, acidization, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, the production has come on now. We are hovering around 110,000 barrels. So uh, we didn't get to where we wanted to get, but now it's going up because of some remedial work that has been done. Put 110,000 barrels a day in perspective for me. How much or how small is that compared to, say, Nigeria or? Well, it is relatively, it's not big, big, because if you look at Nigeria producing around, let's say, about 2 million barrels, Saudi Arabia, the campaign is about 12 million barrels. But, you know, everything... 12 million barrels a day. And we produce 110,000 barrels a day. Everything starts to crumble beginnings. And you cannot just start in that big bang. You need to start small, and then you... But the projections at the beginning was that we will move from 100,000 to 250,000 barrels per day. We've been doing this for two years, and we are still on 110. Yes, as I said, um, there were some few technical issues. Also, mind you, Ghana almost set a record. That is, uh, we, we produced the oil after 41 months after the discovery, which is pretty short. And you see, before you do something of that nature, you need to do extensive things. So I think we were short on that side. We're able to move from... Uh, sort of discovery to production within a record time. Yes, but then you see, once you try and do things in a very fast time, it comes to some um, penalties or it comes to some difficulty. So I think now they are taking their time to do those things. And we hope that they will be able to catch up. The oil is still there, except that we didn't produce what we were to produce. Give, give my listeners a sense of how blessed we are in terms of our reserves. In your book, you go through all the different uh, finds the different wells in terms of the, the, the appraisal that have been done potentially how how much oil resources do we have offshore Ghana? well um, there are various estimates and um, we've been told that we're looking at something like 800 million uh, 
and barrels of about 3 million, sorry, 800 million barrels to about 3 billion barrels in all. Uh, well, in the hot you see, uh, we have about four different basins or reservoirs. We have the um, tunnel, we have the salt pond central, we have the uh, uh, Keta Accra, then we have the onshore one, which is the Botan Basin. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, the place where we do much activity is the Tunnel Basin or the Tunnel Reservoir. Mm -hmm. So if you are to look at everything in its totality, then I think we'll be looking at over uh, 5 billion barrels. It could be more. You know, all this has to come with proper appraisals. So the estimate that we're giving initially was talking mainly about the Tunnel Reservoir. So once we get to the others, I'm sure the figures will go up. It's not easy to come with an exact figure now because appraisals are being done. Even the, the, the tunnel basin, the new wells are being dug, uh, new discoveries are being made. So it's an ongoing process. Mm. But in terms of the volumes, why was, was the performance so disappointing? I mean, maybe I'll come to I mean, on that as well. We, for a long time, we're producing 62,000 or 63,000 barrels a day. Why did that happen? Was it human error? Was it a, I mean, even though, yes, we produced the oil early, why did we, why were we unable to meet our volume projections? I think, as I said, you see, you're looking at something which is um, in the neighborhood of, say, three to five kilometers beneath the surface of the earth. So you need to do proper simulation studies. A lot of technical studies have to be done. Now, in our case, I think we produce pretty much quicker. Mind you, Uganda and a country like uh, Sierra Leone, they have also found oil in commercial They have not started producing. There could be some reason. OK, at times also it's also political. But then the, the longer that you take, the more elaborate studies that you could conduct. Now, if you rush to do things, probably in our case, a bit of rush, uh, you, you, you may not do all those things. Because you see, you're going to really simulate what you think is there, and you have to uh, model some of these things. You have to look at what can happen. So it's a prediction, and that prediction do not always come true. Mm -hmm. But I think... Um, so you, you, see, you think you rushed? I think so, because you see, 41 months, the average time, even though there's no, there's no clear cut, but normal average day takes about five years, which is 60 months. It takes that, 60 months. Yeah. That's five that, years. From the time that you discover to tell me. We did ours in 41 months, which is just under four years. So I think it was pretty So in terms of the, the, the rush, what did you think we missed? Was it the law we didn't spell out correctly? Was it the estimates we didn't get accurately? Well, not so much. The, the law, the, the production, um, 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 does not depend on whether the law is there or the law is not there. But then, it depends on how good you're able to simulate, how good you are you able to model all those kinds of that are there, which nobody is there. You're only doing the using a state of the art machinery. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of experts coming together, so many disciplines coming together. So if you, if you, if you, if you try and do it much faster, you miss certain things. And I think it's a fact of life. Mm. Let's talk about the good the bad and the ugly. So let me start with the good. <laughs> so that it will be easy for people to follow what we are doing. So Mohammed Amin, what has been good about the oil since 2010? Let's talk about the positives. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Bernard. Uh, before I say that, let me add that the 110,000 uh, barrels produced today uh, is not from the original Jubilee Phase 1. It's not. They had to add two new worlds uh, from what we call Phase 1A. Mm. You know, and that is what apart from the acidization, uh, that has taken us to 110,000 uh, barrels uh, a day. Mm -hmm. uh, let me also note, and, and this is very important, that the discoveries that we are making mm -hmm. are not consistent with the appraisal results that we are getting. What In other mean? words, 19 discoveries have been confirmed. Mm -hmm. And that gave Ghana an exploration success rate of about 70%, mm -hmm. one of the highest in the world. But in terms of appraisal success, if you add the appraisal success to the exploration success, we are talking about 78%, which means that in spite of the many discoveries, the appraisal results are not as positive as we should 
You see, what's the difference between discovery success and appraisal success? You drill to look for the oil, and then you find oil. You find that there's oil. That's here. discovery. That's discovery. But appraisal is to determine how much oil, the level of commerciality, you know. And even with the appraisal, those that have been successful are not producing the commercially or economically viable levels of development in terms of how much oil we expect to find. We are under 100 million uh, barrels. Most of some of them are under 50 million barrels. Others are even under 30 million barrels. And therefore, they cannot uh, be developed as stand-alone fields mm -hmm. unless you bring them together. And this is how come the 10 fields, I'm talking about Chinebua, Enira, and uh, Ntome, they have been brought together as com complex to be developed as one field. If you allow them to stand alone, you are not going to get much oil. And so it is important for, for us to note that in spite of the exploration success rate of 70%, which puts us higher in the world in terms of how many discoveries we make, the appraisal successes are not as... And is this as part of the as, rush? I think. Do you think it's a manifestation of the rush or just the nature is of the, the nature, oil It's the nature of the geology, mm. you know, of our basins. And therefore, this is meant to somehow moderate expectations because mm -hmm. you hear mostly politicians say that we've made uh, uh, 16 discoveries, we've made 19 discoveries, we've made 20 discoveries. It's important to note that discovery of oil is not the same as uh, finding commercially uh, viable uh, 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 oil for production. Really? Because I really had recently there was oil in the Keta Basin. Is that, has that been appraised? Do we know the commercial viability? Or is this just discovery? I don't think it's, there's, there's a discovery yet. I think it's a potential. It's yeah? a potential discovery. <laughs> no, it's a potential. Because, because uh, discovery. one of the... A block has been given in Accra area, offshore Accra. Yeah. And that's... He's talking about Kita business. And yeah, it's part yeah. of this. It's called Accra yeah. Kita yeah. business. And yeah. this even extends to the neighboring mm -hmm. country that is uh, 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 Togo. Mm -hmm. and so. Once a block has been given, it, it, it goes... The fine is on the Accra side, yeah, this, on the Kita side. But what I'm saying is within the <laughs> same reservoir. Yeah. So a block was given to one company, TAP. I don't know whether they are still working on it, even if they have relinquished. So once a block is given, it means that uh, one of the does some uh, uh, commercial viability. But for them also to come and so we have found so many. So that the potential, the basin, the, the basin contains, but then uh, we have to come with the numbers. All right, let's good. still talk about the good. So you're saying that the time it took us from discovery to commercial production is record, is very good. What else is positive about the two years in terms of oil? The two years, I mean, first of all, Ghana did not know much about the industry. We are beginning to learn about the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the good things that has happened to us is our inability to meet production targets. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. For purposes of planning, okay. you know, you are able to plan better uh, in the development of future oil fields. Uh, because you know that apart from the rush, uh, we were told that they, they, they faced some technical problems. Mm -hmm. And I remember I called on the government to investigate, mm -hmm. you know, the, the enormity of the, of the problem mm -hmm. in order that we can plan properly for future development. Uh, we also know that the players involved, Talo and Cosmos, they do not have experience in, in production. They usually will find the oil and then uh, dispose of it to uh, develop. It. So this is the first so time they're doing yes, yes, the production. They're doing a major project like, 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 like Jubilee. Dr. Is, is, that, is that correct? Yeah. Yes, you see, uh, we've had the traditional, we call them seven systems. We're looking at BP, we're looking at Shell, looking at Shell, we're looking at Exxon um, model, and Conoco Phillips. You see, um, unfortunately, you are um, Tolo and um, Cosmos. Cosmos. They are not within this. They are not part of the seven. They're the big seven. Yeah. They are we call independent producers. Okay. Uh, independent oil and um, uh, exploration and production companies. So they are now covered, except that they have been quite successful in Africa. Most of the uh, wealthy uh, uh, drilled have produced oil. So they are also coming. I mean, you don't know but their competence is not up to the Chevron, oh, the I mean, BPs, or the Shells. They haven't produced, they haven't operated a field before. Yes, yeah, exactly. You know, and so relative to their experience and the, the fact that we also rise, you expected problems. So two, 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 two issues combined. Yeah, two issues but, combined. But you're saying that's positive. Yeah, Why is that I think positive? it's positive because it has exposed you know, our vulnerability, you know, 
how much money was spent on Jubilee? About five billion spent so far. I understand one billion dollar more is to be spent uh, in the next uh, year. And, and this is so much money. I believe it's more than our budget, our annual budget. And so you cannot take for granted, you know, the mistakes that we are we are making. And if you spend all this money only to be told that there are technical problems, you cannot meet your production target. It's a huge cost to us. You know, even though our share of the cost is not that much, it's still a cost because the, the companies will have to recover the huge cost and that uh, has implications for revenue. The tax, you know, uh, revenue that will come to the, to the government. And, and therefore, I think it's positive because the vulnerabilities have been exposed. We know the mistakes we are making. So we are, we are therefore, possibly more wary yeah, of potential. Yeah. So those are two positives. Yeah. What and else is positive about know, know that we have submitted a development plan for the 10 fields, yes. you know, which is being considered by government. And they said they are not going to rush. They are going because, to of because of past mistakes. Yeah, that is why I think it's so, so, the, so, so the government and yeah. the system, the knowledge about the way the industry works has improved within yeah, the two it years. Has, Massively. It has. It has. It has a significant thing. Yeah. Now, the other good thing is our ability to put in place certain legislations. Okay. You know, for instance, we have the Petroleum Commission Act, you know, which sets up uh, an independent commission to regulate petroleum operations. Uh, we also have the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, which, you know, provides a framework for managing uh, revenues that are generated from the sale of uh, uh, petroleum, as well as from the taxes collected mm -hmm. uh, uh, from, the, from the petroleum companies. You know, uh, that is very positive. In addition to that, uh, so these laws are good, well written, they comprehensive. Are, they are very good, well standard. Indeed, our petroleum revenue management law is, is considered one of the best model for other African countries. Really? Yes. And the case of uh, Timor Leste, where we originally copied parts of their law, you know, the event, eventually the law that we pass is being copied by them now. They are still being our law. So, so our law is system. well written. It's well written, and that is the issue with Ghana. You know. <laughs> we, said, we said it this morning. Yeah. Our laws are world class, but implementation <laughs> yes. is another thing. So you agree, Doc, that our, our PRMA is, is world class? Yes, I think yeah. I would like to add that recently I found myself in one international conference where I presented a paper based on the Petroleum Revenue Management Act. And uh, it was well received. And the comments was that uh, that's why Ghana is the star of Africa. I don't know. What that actually means, but it means that we began to do something good. And um, it, it, it's actually said so the law is there, we need to implement and make sure that we do uh, what is right. So the laws, so the speed was good, the knowledge base has improved, and our law is great. Yeah, we're actually not fast because production started before the revenue management law okay. was passed. Okay. You know, and most people mm -hmm. were wondering how you could start production without having the legal framework for managing the proceeds from the <laughs> from the oil. Which so so the, the law came yeah. after. Yeah, it, the law came, but it went through very uh, exhaustive discussions and consultations. But another good thing I, I, I want to mention is the revenues that we have gotten mm -hmm. so far. Uh, we haven't met our, uh, our targets uh, okay. both in 2011 and 2012. In 2011, we were expected to uh, receive 1.2 uh, billion Ghana cities. Mm -hmm. You know, we ended up receiving about 666 million uh, Ghana cities. Uh, mm -hmm. In 2012, I've seen the figures up to uh, September. We are again expected to uh, receive about <clears throat> 1.2 billion Ghana cities. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, we have we have received about 440. So you are straight into the bad now. I wanted to. No, ask I, I, I'm not saying for bad. Are you saying saying because of the yeah, lateness of yeah, the law? Yeah. But I think it's not the lateness of the law. I, I want to say that even though we haven't met our, our target, the fact that we have injected you know, some revenues from oil into our budget. It's good. It, it provided some fiscal relief, some fiscal respite. Because look at the projects we are spending the money on. 17 road projects around the country are being funded. And you can see you the, you can see the roads. Yeah, you can see the roads, yeah. You know, the other thing is, you mentioned growth. Uh, a growth of about 13%. 13%. You know, or some say 14%. Yeah. 2011 was significant. And this was largely on account of the oil investment, but also oil production. Okay. You know, so it wasn't just a question of the investment, but the production, production, production as, well. as well. You know, and, and so these are these are positive. very positive. We're talking to yeah. two uh, uh, indeed, oil, oil and gas. Indeed, in 2011, yeah. Ghana was the third largest recipient of foreign direct investment. In 2011, yeah, following South Africa and Nigeria, and this and is that was because of the oil investment. investment. Yes, in the whole world. Yes, that's in, you know, in Africa. In Africa, <laughs> the third largest. Yeah, but that's still right. significant. 
Yeah, we're talking to Dr. Joa Samoy Mohammed I mean Adam about the good, the bad, and the ugly of our oil. I've given an chance to start with the good, and they mentioned a number of things. Uh, listeners, you can join us by text 0549986996, and later on, if there's time, you can call it. But let me find out from you. What about the bad? Have, have you finished with your good? <laughs> well, well, I would say that the bad probably rests in the fact that if you make a suggestion and you're not able to achieve it, then it could be classified as bad. But also, um, I, I think that, um, and this, the reason for this has been given, as I said, technical issues and uh, other things. Lack of meeting our estimated or projections in terms of the volume, the volume of oil, that's the main thing. And then, um, um, I think so far we have um, 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 operated uh, well according to what the Federal Revenue Management Act says. Uh, we haven't heard of any um, um, uh, untoward issues. So we hope that uh, with time uh, things will continue that way and then we shall use the oil revenue. Uh, to, uh, you don't uh, seem to have much to say about the negatives. It's, it, because when I read the news, and I, I, I mean, for example, I'm going through the Public Interest and Accountability Committee's uh, semi-annual report for 2012. There are things, key findings include corporate taxes were not paid in the first half of the year in spite of the projected tax revenues expected from the oil companies. Okay, then they go and they, they talk about the provision of Act 815 on allocation of petroleum revenues have not been strictly followed. An amount of 57 million Ghana cities being excess petroleum revenue collected over the ABFA in the first half of the year, and which should have been transferred to the Ghana Petroleum Fund in line with Section 231 of the Act, was not transferred. The excess revenues were allocated to the budget as part of the annual budget funding amount. There are quite a number of things like that, as, as I read through the, the, the findings. Interesting, you're not mentioning that. I mean, do you agree with some of the things that the uh, PIAC says? I, I, I think it, it, it's, the problem is from your question. What you say bad? Yeah, I mean, what? Oil and gas. Yeah, I'm saying that. What, what is bad? I mean, the, the positives or the negatives. They must challenge this. You know. No, if we have to call the spade a spade. No, if you are producing oil and people depend on you to manage the revenues, yeah. if you are not managing the revenues in line with the laws, it is bad. And how else can I ask it? No, no. There are challenges because <laughs> this is a new oil producing country. So it's permissible. Even the mature producing countries are still facing yeah. some of this. So you don't like my question. <laughs> so your question is the issue. I, I think there are challenges. And we all must rise up as a country to confront those challenges and ensure that we better manage. But I, I haven't said that. I, I think that these are real problems we need to be addressing. And the PR, uh, I believe, uh, uh, did a very good job when they produced their report with, with these findings. One of the major problems we've identified is in the estimation of what we call the benchmark revenue. Benchmark revenue is the total amount of oil revenues available for spending and savings in a year. Yeah. You know, and that is what the government generates. Uh, you, you, you give GNPC their equity financing cost, mm -hmm. give them a certain percentage of the net carried and participating interest for investment, new investment. You know, what is left is the benchmark revenue, mm -hmm. which is then divided uh, uh, between uh, three uh, 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 components. First of all, the budget, you know, secondly, the heritage fund, and mm -hmm. thirdly, the stabilization fund. Mm -hmm. Now, if you project a benchmark revenue higher than what you get, what it means is that you starve the petroleum funds of what is due them. Because what goes to the petroleum fund is the excess over what is spent. And if you don't even have enough to spend because you haven't met your target, it means that you deny the petroleum funds the money that should go to the petroleum fund. And that is a key uh, 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 issue uh, that tells us that we are not doing well when it comes to projection. You know, apart from the fact that we are not projecting production volumes uh, well, we are not projecting our uh, revenues well, we will be missing very important expectations of saving some of the petroleum funds for future uh, development because of the poor projections that we are doing. That is one. And the second issue has to do with the corporate tax that we mentioned. Mm -hmm. You know that when the companies in, in, in care costs, they have to recover. And I just told you that the Jubilee cost is about uh, 5 billion. So far, 1 billion more to be spent on, on that. 
uh, Sankofa, they are expected to spend about $3 billion on Sankofa. The 10 are filled. They are expected to spend about $5 billion, another $5 billion uh, uh, dollars on that. And so if you look at how much they are pumping into the development of the films, it is, it's such a huge cost that you have to allow them to recover. We so have does that cost, justify, we have the, cost does that justify the inability to, to pay the, the corporate tax? The corporate taxes are profit-based taxes. And therefore, if you do not declare profit, you don't pay. And so you have a capital allowance in our case for five years. You know, by the end of the five years, it's expected that all the costs will be recovered. And therefore, you will have the full complement of your corporate taxes. But until the costs are recovered, you know, you are not likely to get corporate taxes. Apart from this, let me also mention that uh, the, 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 the recoverable cost for a year may be lesser than the revenue generated. And in that case, it is justifiable to get corporate taxes. And I believe that is what has informed government's plan for some time now. What is bad about this is for government to put in the budget that for 2011, I'm supposed to collect 600 million Ghana cities from companies, from mm -hmm. the oil companies, only to realize that they are not even collecting a penny. Mm. It means that we haven't been looking at the cost. We haven't been looking at the figures the companies are presenting to us. Otherwise, why would we plan to collect up to 600 million Ghana cities, only to be told that the companies haven't recovered their cost? And so where did that no profit? Yeah. So the, the challenge is with our, yeah. in our system our of system. And in 2012, we have done another projection of about 380 million uh, uh, Ghana cities that we are supposed to collect in corporate taxes. As I look at the figures, I'm, I'm not sure that the companies are going to declare profit again. And so we will not get it. And that affects budgetary planning. Because if you want to spend the money, let me give you an, an example. In 2011, the, the, the money we were supposed to spend in the budget from oil uh, was supposed to be 646 million Ghana cities. Eventually, what we spent was 250 million Ghana cities. You know, because the corporate taxes did not come in. And so if you plan in your budget to spend that much only to be receiving less than half of the of the money you expected, then the planned projects and, and programs you, you, you wanted to undertake will not materialize. And that, that is very bad. And this is why I'm saying that our projections are not worth. We have which to which do, body does is it the energy ministry? It's the Ministry of Finance and Economic Plan. And it would appear that they have a deficiency as far as oil and gas accounting no, is as, as far as revenue accounting, I believe. Revenue accounting and projections. But that's serious. It's not serious. It's, it's one of the challenges of a developing country. <laughs> and I think that we have to, first of all, identify that these are real challenges. We shouldn't pretend about them. Because there was a story we last can, week that, that we, we were not able to independently verify the amount of oil produced daily. That if they tell us that they produce X amount of barrels, we just have to take it like that that Ghana has no way of checking. Is that correct? That has to do with the metering. You know, the, the, the flow meters were defective at some point, but these were corrected. Uh, however, the problem is that the revenue authorities have, I believe, two people on the FTPSO. Mm -hmm. And the likelihood that even 10 people can be compromised is there. How much less two people? <laughs> the only thing that would have ensured that Ghana verified independently how much oil is being produced and exported, uh, was to have our own electronic system in the FPS code. The GRA, Ghana Revenue Authority, installed electronic seals, you know, in anticipation of, you know, the valuation problems, so that there will be electronic data transmission to onshore centers established by them. So they can be in their office and then be able to know how much oil is being produced, how much oil is being exported just like the oil companies do in their head office. They sit in London and they know how much oil is being produced, how much oil is being exported. We also installed similar you know, uh, 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 equipment, mm -hmm. but we were prevented. The Jubilee partner, Stalo said that it was interfering with the electronic system of the FPSO because it had not been factored into the design of the FPSO. And so as we speak now, it's only the two people we have on the FPSO. Two individuals? Yes. <laughs> and this is why that news came out. I think that we must wake up as a country because they are going to develop another SPSO. And I have been wondering, 
what role is Ghana going to play in the design of that FPSO? Are we going to wait until the FPSO is developed? We want to fix our electronic seals so that we can verify how much oil is produced, only for them to again tell us that it is interfering with the electronic system. And therefore, we can't monitor. And therefore, we can't Dr. Samar, how does this work elsewhere? Is it normal to have two men who become the, the, the referees for all, sort of the, I mean, would... Yes, I think that, uh, as Amin said, um, you know, having a human eye or human uh, observation is not always the best. I think things should go in the electronic mode because we live in this uh, electronic age or we live in a, a digitized world. So I think, as Amin said, in the next design, in the next episode that we're thinking about, we should make sure that we work with the designers and make sure we incorporate this thing. We don't wait for it to be designed, and then we try to put it, and then somebody says, no, it's going to interfere. And then there are always ways of, they have their own interest, we have our own interests, mm -hmm. and we can work together. But then if only one person's interest is being looked after, then it means we, we, we have a problem. So I think we have to be involved with it. But when the Jubilee partners take a position, does GMPC take an opposite position? Because GMPC are part of the Jubilee partners, and they are representing our interests. Yes. So in, in these discussions about FPSO, for example, what has been the push of the GMPC? Hmm. It would have been good to have a GMPC man here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, 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 we did invite them, but they no. did say that they have, let me just say this, you know, that they had a, a different event today which they had to all attend and therefore they could not uh, give us a representative. No. That was why they did not come for the program. No, what you must recognize is that the GMPC is a partner. But when they go to the boardroom, what we call the Joint Management Committee, yeah, on which we have equal representation, mm -hmm. you know, as the companies. A lot of things happen there. Their discussions are governed by the, the contracts that we sign with them. Now, I want to give you one example of a problem Ghana is faced with. When it comes to budgets, it is the Joint Management Committee that approves all the budgets for all the development and all the activities on the field. But in the event that there is a budget which the oil companies are to undertake on a 100% basis, our representative on the Joint Management Committee cannot object to that budget. While we can object to other budgets and negotiate, when it comes to a budget which is to be undertaken, which is to be you know, spent by the oil companies on 100% basis, we cannot object. Are you serious? Yes. And that was this in the contract? This is in the contract. Who signed it? <laughs> <laughs> or did it so it's a contract <laughs> between the government of Ghana. So the essentially NPC whatever budget and we present before company. us as we, we, we can't we can't reduce we can't remove anything. Which they are to spend on a hundred percent basis. I qualify that. For all the that, partners. Yes. If we cannot object. So if they say they are spending five billion to do A, B, C, D, yes. we can't bet and say we don't yes. think this is necessary yes. Yes. or this is not the cost. Yes, and this is why I think that the government revenue authority needs to be supported because wow. eventually they have to do cost auditing for tax purposes. Exactly. And if they don't have the capacity to do the cost auditing as efficiently as they should, then we are not. Then they can choose never to, to declare profit forever of because course. profit is different. From, I mean, you can you always. Uh, declare profit based on this one. your cost. Yeah. It, it, it happens most of the time. It happens. They inflate the cost through transfer pricing. You know, they reduce our tax base through team capitalization. You know, there are so many things that the companies will do. And this is why you need a very strong, you know, uh, uh, tax uh, system, a very strong tax administration uh, with the, all the capacity to be able to, to do the auditing and ensure that Ghana collects what is due as in, in taxes. But this is, this is incredible because you, you, two of you mentioned to me in terms of the positives that knowledge, our knowledge had increased. Mm -hmm. you, you spoke about how well our laws were written. So why should we have a world-class legislation governing how we use revenue? But we've forgotten about whether the revenue we are getting itself is the maximum we could have gotten. It's almost putting the cart before the horse because if you don't, if, if, if you you don't have the system of verify how much oil is produced, you don't have the system of declaring checking whether the profit so declared is accurate, and you are spending all your energy creating a law to manage the rest of the money you get, and you use a year and a half to do that. There's something obviously wrong. I have to I have to correct an impression. 
there are meters that measure how much oil is produced. But still there are two men. Meters have been installed on the FPSO. Then you have two people from the Ghana Revenue Authority who are also on the FPSO. Do they have experience in this? Let me, let me make this point. But we are saying that in addition to this, you need other integrity mechanisms. Yes. And this was what the Ghana Revenue Authority did by installing electronic seals so that they can be independent verification. And this is what was not allowed. You know, and so there are other measures of how much oil is produced and exported. Just that you also need an independent mechanism to verify, and this is not present at the moment. You, 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 you seem. I mean, I'm alarmed because this is for me. I'm just using a common sense approach to what you are telling me. <laughs> if we have not, we put because uh, Dr. Dob, you're, you're saying that number one, profits as declared, we cannot verify because we don't have. We can't audit the costs independently. And we agree to a contract that contains this. So clearly, somebody didn't do something right there. And I'm not sure if there's any remedial measure now. For example, we have new oil discoveries, new oil uh, uh, contracts to be signed that will be going forward. Do you not think that the, the, the mistakes that have just been articulated should be, should, should be, should be, catered for or corrected in, in the next few contracts? It should, but as you rightly said, uh, Bernard, that um, we seem to be good in putting things on paper, crafting all kinds of policies, uh, documents, strategies, tactics, etc. But when it comes to that ranking, that's where we are. And it's always, at times, time, it's also a case of David and Goliath. You have Somebody who hasn't produced before now dealing with um, well, supposedly big companies. And but these companies don't have experience. As far as what, well, what you said to me was that there are companies which are. Well, they are, they are not they are, big. They as, but then, you see, the, the industry goes with a lot of risk. You see, the other thing would have done is okay, hold on, we are going to fund it. We will do our own. So we go in for our own loan and do it on our own. Whether we find it or not, well, we but we are sharing the risk with them. Yes, in a but, way. But, but we are very more. Yeah, but we are, we, are, we are a country. We are companies. We are a whole country. It is true. But I don't think this is the first time. I mean, we've heard of all kinds of stories. We have to stand firm. At times, it's like other debates. You go, Africans go, and even the same African delegation is funded by those you are going to meet with. Let's say I'm going to negotiate with you. Now you fund me even to come to the meeting. You think when I come, I'll be able to say what I'm supposed to say? I, 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 I won't. So you see, it goes to show that we should also stand and try and see some of this, do it on our own way, and also take the risk. Or you have to say, even if it's a shared risk, it, it should be equal, on equal basis. But we so we don't have, we always have the impression, we don't have, you have it, you do it. Now, once you create that impression, the guy who's doing it can have more say. And then even if he's um, taking a line, share, you have nothing to say, because he, he seems to have funded that right now. Practically, what could government have done to avoid some of these problems? Could we have hired a consultant from another country, for example? Could we have decided to hold on with production until we understood fully the implications of the contract? Because for me, the, the fact that 2011, we are told that government overestimated oil revenue, is clearly for me a manifestation of some of these problems, where we hope that this is what they will declare, but they tell us one or two reasons why they did not get that. And really, there's nothing much you can do. On, in retrospect, do you feel there's a, a bit more need to hasten slowly, maybe go to Nigeria to talk to some of the oil guys? Because it would seem as if we lack a lot of the technical skills to navigate in these very specialized oil waters. Uh, there, are, there are three models. The first one is you find the oil, you leave it in the ground while you build capacity mm -hmm. up to the time that you are satisfied mm -hmm. with the capacity. You have reasonable levels of capacity, then you can exploit it. Mm -hmm. And this is what we call our hoteling model. Mm -hmm. Okay. The second model is what we call learning by doing. Okay. You get the oil, you know that you are going to make mistakes, but you will learn over time. And that is what we are doing. Mm -hmm. And that is what most countries, especially in the developing world, will do. Canada has so much reserves, but they are exploiting it at the level that they, they will not exploit all their resources within a short to medium term. Mm. 
But other countries like us, like developing countries, Ghana, Nigeria, we need the revenues. Our people are poor. We have serious developmental challenges. So we are not going to follow the Harold Potelic model. The best model we are following is the learning by doing. And therefore, the mistakes. And learn, learn by making. doing and lose revenue model. <laughs> that is the mistake. <laughs> that is the mistake. Who, who created that model? <laughs> but it's because, as you said, you have examples to learn from. You know, because there were, I mean, remember, President Bobo started a whole conference in February 2008 to discuss our oil and gas before we started the laws. So at least we have two clear years to plan. But I think that we have problems, but I, I'm, not, I'm not in despair because I know that countries that started production at the level that we are did worse than what we are doing. <laughs> and so I think that uh, we have to move slowly to build the capacity that we need to be able to exploit the resources better. Mm. But I would not agree to any suggestion that we should leave the oil in the ground. Let me ask about Let's gas. The mistakes and learn okay, quick them. comment. I wanted to go to gas because all the other expectations for the oil production was the, 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 the blessings of the gas, yeah. how we could use that to in our thermal plants. And when the West Africa gas had a problem, people were wondering where we'd gotten with that. In terms of the structure of Ghana gas and what they decided they want to do, are we on the right path in optimizing the gas that is a byproduct of the, the oil production? Well, I think um, we have chosen to use the gas to generate electricity. And I think most of it will be going to Abuazi, um, Tema, sorry, the, the Abuazi, sorry, Tema plant. So right. I think that's good. The whole thing is that the projection of maybe getting the gas ready mm -hmm. within the See the first product will not come because we told that I think the earliest will be say June, I think June, July. Mm -hmm. So in that case, uh, we have a bit some few months of them. But eventually, when the gas comes, we'll use it for probably. I think it will go to solve some of the load shedding that we have been having. So in that respect, I think there's some positive. And then later on, we look at petrochemical fertilizer industries, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, we may not have enough gas now, but I think with things like. Um, other folks going to produce, and now we have um, one from called Sankofa, which is almost like a non associated gas. Non associated gas means it's almost pure gas, but little or no oil. I think that would work. But again, also, you know, that fold was found by any, or was being operated by any, and we need to maybe negotiate whether uh, it was ahead that they wanted to export the gas. We also need a gas lookup. So I think. It's a question of negotiation between the government and then. But you, 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 you see the sense in using the gas for power generation? Definitely. Because, I mean, without power, see, you, you, I was telling somebody that I would rather pay a little bit of premium to have my electricity on than maybe not to have it at all. I mean, the loss or the cost of not having the electricity is much more than probably the little inconvenience you pay by probably paying more. Like you rather have, because the electricity controls everything, our computers, our industries, our schools, everything. So if you don't have it, I mean, almost everything comes to standstill. If your lights go up, people don't work on their computers, the industries are down, people cannot study well because they cannot even boot up. So you know what I mean. So electricity is everything and we need to get it. So whatever it takes for us to get our uh, electricity running, I think we need to do that. Mm. Comments, Kwame says, is it true that the Keta Basin block has been grabbed by some politicians and their cronies and are already trading it globally and making money? That's just a question. Another one uh, wants me to find out from you whether you think that the new FPSO is up to standard. I think there's a plan to get a new yeah. FPSO. Whether uh, it would solve the problems of the first one. Again, I think that question is important because there are new discoveries going to be made. Yeah. And if the FPSO is being brought, do we know whether it's big enough, it's mobile enough, or why about? Maybe we'll talk about that a bit. Another one. Um, government can do more to train Ghanaians for the oil and gas industry. Revenue management must also be very transparent. This is from Seth. Uh, Gabriel says the rush was just to make the finances look good. Government rushed in order to have more disposable income. Um, Justice Atu says we have nothing to show for our oils. We still have power shortage. So another one says uh, the oil in question here is from the Western region, and we are not beneficiaries of that. Uh, you guys dig the oil here and make account in Accra. Come and see the youth in Takradi. They are jobless. 
um, Eric Kwabunaku says the beneficiaries of the are MPs who are taking 7,200 CDs a month with 5,000 rent allowance. Uh, I haven't seen anything yet from the oil, personally. Eric says, Joseph, uh, Captain Buedu says, we need a long-term policy that would really outline how the revenue generated will be managed and allocated. We need to be able to spell out that this percentage will be used on roads, that percentage on government expense, and that on the consolidated fund, etc. Uh, Manuel says, why don't you tell Ghanaians that we don't own the oil? You know that a huge percentage of the oil has been offered in exchange for drilling, and these drillers ship the crude straight to the international market for maximum profit, while we jubilate over a lousy 10% share as a country. Why do you think the Chinese are destroying our lands to find last gold in Ghana? We sit back so that these people dig and drill our natural resources and then loan it back to us with huge interest. What is wrong with us? Tell the people the truth and don't throw the question back at us. Let me ask you a question about the structure of the Jubilee partnerships. Do you feel that GMPC has learned enough to own a bigger stake and therefore we should put more investment? Because as you said, it's a question of risk. So with this Keta business and all that, with two years, do you think that we should sell a smaller stick of the, the, the new discoveries to the partners and, and maintain a larger term for ourselves? In view of the fact that we can't verify profits, costs we don't know, do you think that GMPC has lent enough in two years? I think let me try and answer this question with uh, uh, the fun analogy. You know that we've always been saying that uh, developing countries are always in a rush to sell their things, raw materials, mm -hmm. instead of adding value. I think it comes out to me the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, a little weight to an adding value to probably triple or double the revenue, but more often than not, developing can to rush to sell the raw material. I'll give you an example, which I've given some time ago. Um, a, a ton of um, bauxite was some time ago selling for just about 25 US dollars, but then after it's been refined and reduced into aluminum, it was selling for. 2,500. That's a factor of 100. Wow. So, will you rather sell that in the raw form or will you add value and then maybe reap that uh, higher profit? I think we seem to always go to do the latter. We say that, oh, add value, but in the end, we don't. But maybe our development imperative is different. We, we need the revenues early to build roads. And also, we don't have the competence or the skill to convert the raw material to a more value-added form, well, to compete with those who've been uh, doing it for years. I, I don't want to agree with this. You see, skills are not like country-specific or country-based. I mean, the skills are all over. Even if you go to the internet, almost everything you want to do, you find answers there. It's a question of maybe the capital or the planet or a bit of waiting. I don't know, why would somebody want to go to school get a BSc, get a master's, and someone says, no, I won't go, I'll go and do trading immediately. He wants his money. Maybe if he had waited to get a degree, maybe he could have made more money. So uh, it's a question of also our terms of planning and coordination. As um, um, Amin was talking, you realize that some people sit down and plan, and they have no clue even the reality on the ground. Because some of these produce, some of these planning, and if they talk together, no. somebody is sitting somewhere for planning, <laughs> and somebody else is producing. So the plan has nothing to do with what yeah, is on the ground. Or the that we do that. So because we have problems, mm. we cannot achieve this. Because uh, these people have to write their capital, we cannot get that task. But then, so, so we have to get so much, then we make so much, then at the end, the task is not. Because somebody didn't verify that, that the capital has to be written off. Mm. So that we lack coordination, we have a plan, and also we lack blueprint because uh, we see that. Almost every four years, we started something new. And then one the four years, but we started all over again. So there's no continuity. Yes. But, but on the question, Dr. Um, I mean, do you think we should sell a smaller stake and GMPC should increase? Has GMPC improved within the period enough? You know, GMPC has so much experience. They have been in this industry for some time now. And they've even uh, worked in other countries, Equatorial Guinea and other countries, the NPC has provided services. So in terms of experience and expertise, they have built experience and expertise over time. Uh, what I think we need to do as a country is to ensure that we are in the driving seat. And one of the ways to do this is to strengthen our GNPC and let them have the bigger say, you know, 
the situation where they go to joint management committee and because we have 3.7 percent you know paid interest we don't have much say we need to increase their shareholding in our, our petroleum agreements that we sign because this is what will strengthen them and, and enable them to lead the way in, in protecting Ghana's interest as we, we said today GNPC is not able to meet their investment requirements the petroleum revenue management law says, says that apart from their equity financing cost GNPC should be given not more than 55 percent of the net carry and participating interest but the government hasn't given them more than 40 percent since we started spending the oil revenues the allocation to them has been 40 percent consistently one wonders what the rest is being used for and if you are not financing GNPC well I've seen some figures which indicate that in the next five years they will need 2.7 billion US dollars to be able to meet its investment uh, requirement. Then you give them uh, 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 39 million, you know, 40 million a year that they are not going to meet. It's peanuts. And so, if we want the NPC to play that role, as for the expertise they have, what they have decided to do now is to form partnership with other private companies. You heard of GNPC Technique Engineering Services Company, which is a new company that they have set up in order to leverage on the finances of Technique okay. to be able to make investment and make some money for the country. So until we give them the necessary support, you know, in terms of resources, yeah, they are not able to lead our quest to maximize the the, the, the benefits from the industry. Let me read a few comments. Jude says, good morning, Bernard. I'm enjoying your program and I'm impressed. Please find out for me how far the local content law has gone and what are plans in place by government to provide jobs for the over 7,000 Ghanaians, young Ghanaians who have been trained and certified in oil and gas at MDPI GIG in Accra. This is from Jude. Another one, oil and gas in Ghana, five figures in terms of success, but my concern is to what extent will this uh, oil and gas have on the ordinary person on the streets? In Binaba, because for now it does not appear to me that we are producing oil. This is Jerry Akurugu in Sandma. Kofi says, Good morning. My question is that have they started selling the oil? God bless you. Oh, you have been sleeping with your legs outside. They've been selling it a long time. Local content, that's we have only time to What we made a lot of noise about local content. But by the time, it's not it's not it's, it's, a, it's a capital intensive area. It's not a good it's not a job generating growth pool because you can produce a lot of oil, but the, the labor intensity is very low. And we also have a local content in terms of some of the, 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 the raw the sorts of the, the equipment and all that. Is, is local content really, is not, isn't it overrated in the way we, we've discussed it in Ghana? As far as oil and gas is concerned. Yes, um, I think some people uh, thought that once you said local content, it will mean that every man working in the street will get a job there or at least will be, become a consultant or will be able to supply services. Mm. But of course, uh, previously when uh, GNPC was the uh, regulator, uh, they were charging like uh, 1,000 Ghana cities to get the license even to be able to supply service. Now it went to after the law of the Ghana Petroleum came into effect. That role has gone to the Petroleum uh, Commission mm -hmm. and they are charged. I think the minimum that's being charged is about for you to get a line is about 2,000. So it depends on the category of uh, uh, business you are in or how big or how small your company is. And there's an organization called GOSPA, that is Ghana Oil Services Producers Association. They are trying to talk to the GN, uh, sorry, the Petroleum Commission to bring down this cost because if these costs are high, your average man cannot. Of course, it's also a highly technical industry. You need the, to build the capacity. So I think the government, mm -hmm. in addition to bringing in a policy, of course, the parliament is also working on to bring what we call legislative interest to give a legal backing to this um, uh, local content. The government needs to actively get involved in also building the capacity because nobody will do it and people may not have the resources. The government has to help people to build the capacity. It, it has been done elsewhere, even has been done during the first uh, uh, republic when during Kremers with him. He helps some Ghanaian entrepreneurs to, 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 to stand on their feet. So we need to do it. Otherwise, you see that the industry will continuously be dominated by foreigners, mm. where we, we get nothing out of it. Because somebody just sent a text that they train 7,000 Ghanaians in MDPI. Lots of young guys are going abroad to Aberdeen and Dundee 
doing a master's in oil and gas management. But is that the kind of, is that the approach that we should use to involve locals? Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, you know, we are, as you said, overrating local content. Mm. And our emphasis seems to be misplaced. There are three things we need to do. And that is going the way of Trinidad and Tobago. That is going the way of Nigeria, very recently. Mm -hmm. Construction, installation, and fabrications. This is where we need construction, to go. Construction, construction, installation, installation, installation and, fabrication. and fabrication. Because our industry is a small industry. And so what we can benefit from that small industry is to use that basis to develop our construction capacity, our installation capacity, and also our fabrication capacity. For instance, they are doing FPS codes. They need people who can do fabrication. You are doing pipelines. You need people who can fabricate the pipeline. And so you train these people along these lines so that even when the oil industry is no more, the skills that they have can be applied to other industries. This is the way we should go. But apart from that, the GMPC side is important. I think that if they can increase their stake, the local content will be enhanced. There is also the proposal that in every contract that we sign, a certain percentage should be reserved upon commerciality to be floated on the Ghana Stock Exchange so that beyond the government of Ghana GNPC, you have ordinary Ghanaians also you know, uh, owning shares from these corporations. This for me is the way we should go about local. And not giving people scholarships to go and study masters in oil and gas. The scholarships are important because one of the problems of developing countries is how to manage the resources, the policy and the legal side. The policy side. The policy side. Because if your policy fails, then the entire industry will fail. And so the training we provide for people to do management, you know, most of our companies here are managed by engineers. Go to GNPC. They, they are, are mostly engineers. engineers. Yes. But we need that management component. Lawyers. Yes, yeah, we need to train people in governance. Who, yeah. Yes, the governance side is also good. And this is why I think that the scholarships we give people to go and are to. important. But overall, if we have to train people to work in the industry proper, these three things, wow. applications, installations of materials, and constructions oil related. We hope the right people are listening. My guest for the morning, Mohamed Amin Adam, Executive Director of Africa Center for Energy Policy, a long term friend of mine who is <laughs> we were now doing Aluta together <laughs> in the university. <laughs> no, he, he was way ahead of me. I was one of his, his protégés in the past. And Dr. Joe Asamoa, who is the author of two books. Where can we get these books? Making the Oil and Gas Finding Ghana a Blessing. And then, what's the title of the other books? Uh, the Global. Oil and gas bonanza, African share. You can get these books from Legon Bookshop. Mm -hmm. You can get from um, EPP Bookshop. You can get it from Accra Mall. That's the lifestyle. Yeah, it's actually an easy read, and I I urge you to get it because you it's... can also get it from uh, Kingdom Books. Okay, and, and then from the other major, major bookshops. Uh, bookshop. It's only one forty pages. It's an easy read, and I think that who if you if you really want to understand in a nutshell what is at stake with our oil and gas. This is the book. We are waiting for your book as well, Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor Mohammed Amin. I'm not finished, my, my PhD. PhD. I'm sure you finish soon. Yeah, Thank you, guys. It's, it's been a pleasure yeah. having you on Thank the show. You. This program was streamed live on CTFM Online. You can watch a video on our website if you missed the program and you tune in late. This program will be on CTFM Online, where you can get to watch the video.